please join me in a unison reading of Psalm 31, verses 9 through 16. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery, and my bones waste away. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, the horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to any acquaintances. Those who see me in the streets flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord, and I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant and save me in your steadfast love. Today's Gospel reading is Mark 14, verse 32 to 42, with Luke 22, verse 44 inserted. They came to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. He said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death, remain here and keep awake. And in his anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for all things are possible, remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough, the hour has come, The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Christ, our teacher, for us you were obedient even to death. Teach us to obey God's will in all things also. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Gethsemane. Geographically speaking, Gethsemane is a little garden located just outside the city of Jerusalem. Simply put, Gethsemane is the place where Jesus prayed just after his last supper with his disciples and shortly before his betrayal by a friend. And... Gethsemane is the place of his arrest by his enemies. But Gethsemane is more than a geographical location on some map. Gethsemane has psychological connotations. I love the way poet Ella Wheeler Wilcox puts it in her poem entitled Gethsemane. Wilcox writes, down shadowy lanes across strange streams, bridged over by our broken dreams, Behind the misty caps of years, beyond the great salt fount of tears, the garden lies. Strive as you may, you cannot miss it on your way. All paths that have been or shall be pass somewhere through a place called Gethsemane. All those who journey soon or late must pass within Gethsemane's gate, must kneel alone in darkness there and battle with some fierce despair. God, pity those who cannot say, not mine, but thine, who only pray, let this cup pass 
and cannot see, there is point and purpose to a place called Gethsemane. And so Gethsemane isn't just a place in Jerusalem. Gethsemane is a state of mind when one is distressed, agitated, and deeply grieved even to death. Gethsemane is a challenging time when one's soul is overwhelmed and overcome with sorrow, even to the point of death. Gethsemane is a moment in our lives when we shed tears and our sweat falls to the ground like great drops of blood. Gethsemane is the place where Jesus wrestled with the greatest decision of his earthly journey, whether to go on to the cross or not. And Luke records in his gospel that Jesus' sweat was like great drops of blood falling to the ground. By the way, what Luke describes in medical terms is known as hematidrosis, and it is a condition that causes people under great stress to burst their capillaries, their tiny blood vessels, and then they release small amount of blood into their sweat glands, and the sweat that falls looks like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Gethsemane is a moment, a moment in time when the mountain seems too high to climb, when the oceans seem too wide to cross, where the valleys seem too deep to navigate. Gethsemane is a place where the burden seems too heavy to bear, the task too tough to tackle, and where tomorrow seems too hard to face. Gethsemane is the place where the great, the important, the ultimate issues of life are fought and decided. Now, let me be clear. No one wants to go to Gethsemane. Because in Gethsemane, we feel inadequate. We feel weak, uncertain. And our only desire in Gethsemane is to run away from whatever it is we know is coming our way, whatever responsibility being thrust upon us. But as the poet said, all those who journey soon or late must pass within Gethsemane's gate. So there is no escaping this place called Gethsemane. The question then isn't, must we go to Gethsemane? That's already been decided. Each and every one of us, at some point in our lives, must enter Gethsemane. The late South African President Nelson Mandela says, he struggled in this place called Gethsemane, wondering as his release from Robbins Island approached, whether he was prepared to handle the weight of the challenge he was being called to. Sainted Mother Teresa said she lived much of her life in Gethsemane, tormented by doubts about the very faith she pro pro professed. Let me tell you that I too have struggled more than once in my lifetime in this place called Gethsemane. I recall the Gethsemane moment that came when I was graduating from seminary, wondering as I walked down the aisle of my graduation from the Interdenominational Theological Center if in fact I was prepared for ministry questioning my call to ministry, and anxious and apprehensive about proclaiming God's word. And yes, the words of the poet rang true. All those who journey, soon or late, must pass within Gethsemane's gate. Gethsemane comes to each and every one of us. The person facing surgery and wondering if they will survive. The patient awaiting a diagnosis and praying for God's healing mercy, but afraid of what lies ahead the person who just lost a loved one, whether through divorce or death, and wondering what comes next in their lives. The child charged with caring for their aging parent, the parent who discovers their child is abusing drugs, the spouse whose spouse has become abusive, those contemplating marriage, considering or forced to change careers, are all entering Gethsemane. The question then is it must we go to Gethsemane for sooner or later Gethsemane comes? No, the question is what will I do when I get to my Gethsemane? And how we exit Gethsemane is determined by how we enter Gethsemane. Do we go into Gethsemane believing our God has it all in control? Do we go in believing that all things work together for good? Some enter Gethsemane and leave mentally and emotionally depleted. Others enter Gethsemane and rather than face what lies ahead, run away. Others compromise their integrity, succumb to drugs, while still others lose faith while struggling in Gethsemane. But then there are those who exit Gethsemane stronger than ever, 
a halo over their heads, a sparkle in their eyes, a glow on their faces, and strong conviction in their voices. Ask one of these to describe how they felt when they left Gethsemane, and you'll hear them proclaim in the words of the old spiritual, I felt like shouting, I felt like singing, I felt like dancing when I came out of Gethsemane because I was leaning, I was trusting in the Lord. Gethsemane is life's proving ground. Gethsemane comes before the battle begins. It is before one carries the cross. It comes before you know there will be a resurrection, a new birth, a new beginning for you. Before you know that God's tomorrow is going to be better than today, Gethsemane is a place, a time, a moment in our lives when we are where Jesus was in a garden. Our friends are gone. Our hearts are, ach are aching. Our minds are troubled. Our souls are sorrowful. This moment in Gethsemane is unlike anything in all of recorded history. The gospel writers provide us with a glimpse into a personal and private moment in the life of Jesus, a night when his disciples could not watch and pray, not for one hour. It is a moment unlike anything ever recorded. Because in this moment in Gethsemane, Jesus could decide he just can't do it. In Gethsemane, Jesus could refuse to go to Calvary and on to the cross. In this place called Gethsemane, the salvation of the world hangs. It is in these Gethsemane moments that our true character, who we really are, what we truly believe, what we are committed to, surfaces. It did for Jesus in Gethsemane. For Jesus, Gethsemane is far removed from the Jordan River, where the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus as a dove, and, and God's voice declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Gethsemane is far removed from the crowds who marveled at Jesus' words and miracles. Jesus is alone now. The moment of decision has arrived, and Jesus throws himself down on the grounds of Gethsemane before the God who sent him into the world. And Jesus peers out of Gethsemane, and he sees what lies ahead in the city of Jerusalem just outside of Gethsemane. There's Judas waiting to betray him. There are soldiers waiting to arrest him. There's Peter waiting to deny him. There's Pilate waiting to wash his hands of him. There's Herod waiting to ridicule him. There's the crowd waiting to taunt him. There will be the mockery of a trial, nails waiting to pierce his feet and hands. A soldier's spear is poised to pierce his side. Vinegar will be offered to quench his thirst. Thorns will prick his head and an old rugged cross is ready to bear his body. 33, 33. Jesus was only 33. No one wants to die at 33, least of all by crucifixion. There were so many questions still unanswered. Had his message gotten across? Were the disciples ready to spread the good news of God's love? And as Jesus prayed in Gethsemane that night, he must have felt like giving up. Have you ever felt like giving up? Have you ever felt inadequate for the challenge before you? Jesus' humanity is evident in Gethsemane as he asks, do I have to die? And if I have to die, does it have to be on an old rugged cross? It is no wonder that Jesus prays three times, Abba, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Abba, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Abba. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, he wanted two things. First, he wanted human companionship. And so taking with him Peter, James, and John, Jesus said to them, watch with me for one hour. In times of trouble, when our hearts are breaking and our souls are aching, we need the companionship of those who know us, who love us, and who care about us. I still recall when my own father died over 35 years ago, how important it was to me and my family to see family and friends and loved ones, some of whom we hadn't seen in years, come and sit and wait with us. They didn't have to say anything. They didn't have to do anything but their presence and their prayers let us know that they were with us in our hour of bereavement. And Jesus, in this seemingly God forsaken moment, needed his friends to pray with him but they couldn't stay awake, not for one hour, and pray. 
But as our own Jody Hedberg cautioned us this past week in our open Bible study, Jody said, don't be too hard on the disciples. How often do we start praying and simply fall asleep? <laughs> Not only did Jesus seek human companionship, but Jesus wanted to commune with God. When we are facing tough and testing times, we need to look to heaven to anchor our lives. The psalmist prayed, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My soul and body wastes away from grief. What would it be like if in our hour of need, we felt as if God wasn't there, that God didn't care? Gethsemane is Jesus's moment of decision, and Jesus throws himself down on the earth and cries out, Abba, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But just as quickly, Jesus says, not what I want, but what you want. Yes, Gethsemane was a scene of distress. Yes, it was a moment of grief and sorrow. But my sisters and brothers, there is good news out of Gethsemane. The good news out of Gethsemane is that despite the distress and grief in Gethsemane, Jesus looked beyond his Gethsemane moment and saw something, something that pushed him on to Calvary and onto that cross. And I just believe that what pushed Jesus on from Gethsemane was that when Jesus looked out of Gethsemane, he not only saw Peter waiting to deny him, Pilate waiting to wash his hands of him, Herod waiting to ridicule him, the crowd waiting to mock him. The good news out of Gethsemane is that Jesus looked beyond the mockery of his trial, the nails awaiting his hands and feet, the crown of thorn that would pierce his head, the cross lifted to bear his body. The good news out of Gethsemane is that Jesus looked past the agony and anxieties of that moment. And when Jesus looked down through the corridors of history, I just believe Jesus saw us. Jesus saw you. Jesus saw me. And that Jesus thought that you were, that I was worth dying for. The good news out of Gethsemane is that Jesus in prayer found the strength for the journey to Calvary and on to that old rugged cross. The late Andre Crouch composed a song that says, I don't know why Jesus loved me. I don't know why he even cared. I don't know why Jesus sacrificed his life for me. Oh, but I'm glad. I'm so glad he did. My sisters and brothers, you know and I know that there will be times when we are called to leave our places of comfort and journey to our Gethsemanes. And in our Gethsemanes, we just may suffer hematidrosis. And in our distress, our sweat may fall to the ground like great drops of blood. But the good news out of Gethsemane is that no, never alone. No, never alone. Jesus promised he would never leave us, never leave us alone. Yes, the good news out of Gethsemane is that as we stand in all of our tough and testing times in life, we know that our God is with us through it all, through it all. Yes, the good news out of Gethsemane is that even in the face of a cross and death, we can still cry, Abba, not what I want, but what you want be done. Amen.